What are the most frequent challenges in localization? Well, the main issue we face in localization, in terms of technology at least, is the file formats. So clients could send you anything from a very simple text file, an XML file, a JSON file, or a database. So in the end, uh, the main challenge is to be able to extract the contents before translating them. So what comes after is quite easy, but extracting the contents uh, sometimes is quite difficult. Um, that's probably the main challenge we face. But there are other challenges, uh, such as the lack of knowledge uh, by the clients or, or, or the lack of um, having thought what are the steps they want to. Because in localization, we don't only extract text, localize, and deliver back. Uh, what we have to do also is to test the strings. We need to compile the application sometimes. We need to test the final application in the local environment, etc., etc. So a challenge is to explain to the client what are these steps and how uh, we can organize a project so we can uh, properly localize the product. So it's not pure translation. In my opinion, these are the main challenges. For a short answer, at least. Which tools do you use for localization? Uh, well, uh, there are three main types of tools when it comes to localization, to localization. Uh, one is the localization editors, such as Pasolo, uh, which allow you to work on the typical file uh, formats. Another one, of course, is the uh, translation editors, so in some cases we cannot use a tool like Pasolo, so we need to work with another file format, so we need a translation editor. And finally, uh, we use a lot um, either custom tools which allow us to check the quality of the files, or to check specific aspects of the files, variables, uh, concatenation, etc., or we use the integrated development editors, such as Visual Studio or Eclipse, which allow us to open the files compile them, check them in their native environment. What would you advise to training institutions to help improve a student's competence in localization? Well, when it comes to training institutions, um, in my opinion, and that's what I do when I collaborate with university, I think collaboration with the private market is important because in private market, we can see real projects, we can see real tools, we can see real needs from the market. And I believe also that when I say collaboration with the private market, it means trying to find examples of real projects uh, to localize. That's what we do with our students. We try to search for small applications they can localize once they've learned how to localize. And the second part is to try to get consultancy or advice or small lectures from professionals coming from the sector. So if you have the chance that in your city you have somebody working on software localization, a localization manager, a localization engineer, a translation which specializes in localization, I would bring them to the trans uh, training institution to talk to the students, to show them their work, and to, to show exactly what they do, which really will give a better picture of what they will do in the future when they will start working. So collaboration for me has two parts. One is talking to the professionals, and the second part is using real examples from real life. And that's something really fun for students, they like it, they see a product, they feel proud of what they've localized, and it's a good way, I think, to teach localization, which is not an easy thing, to be honest. What would you regard as essential skills required from translators for efficiency to work in an office? Okay, one, well, when you talk about essential skills, at least today, there is no doubt, they need to know about CAD tools. And when I say CAD tools, it's a bit more than just translating inside of a CAD tool. It's being able to create a project, so to open a file, to count words, to know how to get statistics or reports, word counts, to be able to translate, of course, and also to run the quality checks and to export the final files. So that would be really the essential um, CAD tools. There are other things they can learn, uh, how to search for uh, specific file information formats, uh, how to get reference, etc. But the essential for me, the, the minimum, the must-have, is the CAT tools knowledge. There is no way today in the industry to start working without CAT tool knowledge. That's my uh, opinion on that, yes.
What kind of technology is most common in translation company? Well, most common uh, today, of course, CAD tools. They're used to analyze files, to translate and so on. Terminology is very common in most of the projects. Um, machine translation is becoming common, so it's still not used on every project, on every company, but people are coming slowly or, or, or lately not that slowly, so people are coming to that. And then there are many other technologies which need to be used for specific projects. For example, if it's a, a DTP project, a desktop publishing project, we need to use tools such as uh, editing packages such as uh, Adobe Creative, for example, with FrameMaker, InDesign, etc. We need to use uh, graphic editing packages such as uh, Photoshop or Illustrator. And if it's a multimedia project, we might need to use Adobe Animate, which was called Flash previously, maybe you know it uh, by Flash, or tools such as um, Adobe After Effects or Articulate or Captivate for uh, multimedia e-learning projects. So we use a lot of tools depending on uh, the final output. If it's a software project, we might need to use an integrated development editor, such as uh, Visual Studio or Eclipse, or specific uh, tools also to work on specific formats. I'm thinking of Qt Linguist, uh, PyEdit, Pasolo, etc. So the most common technologies used depend really on the project by the client. The most common or the, the central one being, of course, any CAT tool uh, for the project, yes. How do companies select technologies or tools? Well, there are two ways to do it. One way is the customer driving you. So the, class, the customer tells you, you need to translate this with this tool. In this case, there's no choice. You simply select because you're forced to use this tool. In other cases, if you have freedom, and if you need to decide which is the main tool you want to use, there can be several reasons. One is uh, price, of course. I mean, we, we buy on price. A very important one is uh, penetration in the market. So you will probably use a tool that more people uses, or more translators uses, or more reviewers, because obviously you will find more resources to be able to help you on these tools. That's a very important reason. And one thing that we analyze many times is the support. Uh, how does the support work? Is it community-based? Do people answer at their forums? Is there a support program? Do we need to pay for the support program? Uh, what is the uh, service level agreement? Do they answer if you have an issue in the next hour, in the next day? Do they not answer? Because this happens in some cases. So we also check the support. And basically, with all these um, criteria, we decide which is the tool. We don't always select a single tool, to be honest. Translation companies work with several tools, not only because of the customers, but because several tools are more adapted, or, or specific tool is more adapted to a specific project than another one. So in some cases, we have a mix of tools, and we try to decide for each project which one will be used. Which kind of machine translation is most used in translation companies? Well, machine translation for translation companies still, for many of them, depending on the size and on the investment they've done on machine translation, is like a black box. So they basically buy a service, they buy a provider, or they pay a provider per month, per year, per words, per characters, and they get machine translated words. So in many cases, people don't even know what is the type, since you ask for the type. Uh, in my experience, other companies uh, which create their own engines, or when we build a new engine to come to other companies, what we are using lately, and it's changing slowly, are statistical-based uh, systems. So systems which use statistics and not rules and not neural networks in most of the companies. But I'm talking about this now in 2017, and that is changing progressively. So we are changing the systems. We use a lot of hybrid systems also, and sometimes hybrid systems plus some post-editing, uh, which is uh, done via uh, search and replace tools, basically, or, or parsers which check the files and then uh, change, the, uh, change the words that need to be replaced and so on. 
So my answer would be, most of the systems today are statistical, in my own experience, and to be honest, most of the companies don't even know what is the type of system, system they are using, because it's like a paid service in some cases, and they don't know what is behind the curtains. What are the technological prerequisites for entering the market as a translation service provider? Well, the minimum, again, is to have CAT tools. And when I say to have CAT tools, is to be proficient in CAT tools for a service provider. So you need to be able to work with almost any file format with the CAT tools, to be able to give support to your translators on the CAT tools and so on. That's the prerequisite. Then you can add layers over that, which can be, for example, um, to add terminology skills or, or tools, to add localization tools, to add specific check tools or testing tools, to add uh, compilation tools, etc., etc. But really, the basic that is needed in the industry to start a translation company, in terms of technology at least, is to be proficient in CAT tools. That is really the, the most important thing, yes. What is the best way to remain up to date in the use of translation technologies? Well, one easy way, which gives other advantages than staying up to date, is to go to fairs, to conferences, to meetings. There are many in Europe, many in the States, many in Asia, so there is no excuse not to go there. There is where you will see the trends in the industry, you will see what happens and so on. But in these conferences, usually you won't get a proper training. So you will know what is a trend, but you need to get trained. So the next step is uh, to, learn, to learn. And some people try to learn by themselves. So they just check out uh, videos on YouTube, on the internet, they do tests, they, they just install applications and try. But they spend a lot of time on that. It's a good option, but they spend a lot of time. Another option is to hire training consultants to go to the tools providers directly, to ask them who can train them, and to hire these people to give specific trainings every month, every three months in a company, every six months. So I think there are two parts. One is to stay up to date through conferences, fairs, etc., and also through literature. So there are online blogs that you can read, there are uh, magazines that you can also uh, receive, uh, subscriptions, and the second way is, once you know what you need to learn, is to hire the right people, which will really show you what you need to learn uh, in, in, in less time than it would take you to learn by yourself. But of course, the option of do it yourself is always valid in this industry. We've done it for ages and we continue doing it. Um, when we talk about new tips now that I, uh, or, or new, or new, uh, new technology, one thing that, for example, we, we need to take into account, it's a recommendation I give to, to universities, is that there is a new profile of translators which exists today, which is the post editor. And I think that universities should start offering uh, post edition training. They should teach the students to translate, to review, to uh, manage terminology, but also to post edit. I think it's the right moment to do it. And that is something that we learn. Uh, by going to first, we see that there, is, there are more needs and more needs uh, to have post editors because machine translation is increasing and the profile of the translator is changing in some cases. So that's what I can say about acquiring new skills. And post editing is just an example uh, because it's a trend now. So maybe in two years I will talk about a new, a new profile, but today what we are talking about is about uh, machine translation and post editing. Yeah.